better. So uh, my name is Daniel. I am the uh, one of the organizer um, and volunteer at CYP in the Chinese Young Professional Network. And we were founded back in 2010, so it's been about 10 years now. Um, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit uh, with 14,000 members um, and also one of the largest young professional group for Chinese in North America. And our mission statement is to making sure that uh, we can provide an opportunity for career-minded individuals um, you know, for you to develop socially, professionally, and civically. And what it means to us is we have a lot of events, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, career opportunities, uh, opportunity for us to exchange, um, you know, entrepreneurial in information, networking, um, and also most important, having fun. So there's, uh, you know, as you can saw from the, I can see from the video we had earlier. Uh, so there are a lot of outdoor events, this kind of like this portion right here, um, the ski trip, surfing classes, group hiking, whatever uh, we have in the East Coast and also in the West Coast. And also we have industry seminar, um, career development. And this is where we, uh, this particular session sitting, uh, we are doing the negotiation at this point. And it will also we had the leadership development about two weeks ago, actually no, a few weeks ago. And then we're going to have an influence session uh, about a month from now. So there will be more career development that's kind of agnostic to your profession um, coming up in the in the next few months, and also Daniel, in the past, screen sharing is lost. Oh, it, it is. Said. Okay. It is still on, uh, mine is okay. Um, did it lost for everyone? Come on the chat if it's lost. Mine's fine. Okay, let me okay. Just stop sharing. And... I think just one person's is lost. Okay. Everyone, Ma Megan's, I think yours is lost. Everyone else is fine. Yeah, mine's fine as well. Yeah, maybe my... Megan back yours. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can. Okay, got it. All right, so um, we all grown, we're going to have more industry seminars as well. Uh, so format typically was that we had off, offline events at MIT. Um, this is the Boston-based group, but also, I mean, like I mentioned, it's a nationwide as well. Um, but we are going to have more virtual sessions uh, in the coming month, given the, the current circumstance. And as you can also, you know, also see on the right side, if uh, you happen to be in Boston, we also do a lot of competitive events in Dragon Ball racing, ballroom dancing, and dance battles. Um, so there's a lot of interesting, exciting offline events that if you happen to be in Boston or being in you know, Southern California, there's a lot of opportunity for you to participate in. All right, and here is the group picture and also most important, the WeChat session um, that you can have in the center. Um, I think, okay, so I think there might be some issues with my, with my uh, um, Give me one, second, one more second, sorry. All right, there's a WeChat session, uh, or sorry, WeChat QR code, and also the pictures we have um, on the screen. So feel free to scan it and then follow our um, official accounts. All right, so without further ado, let's get into the actual session itself. Um, the speaker is gonna be uh, Nancy. So she is um, currently a uh, group direct, uh, sorry, the director of product manager and also the group product managers at um, uh, Verizon and uh, she, you know, mainly in charge of the cloud and edge computing. And in the past, she also led a large team of tech PMs and interviewed more than 100 candidates. She's also very well known um, as her, um, you know, work as, you know, as a YouTuber and Instagram, you know, key opinion leader on the product management, career development, and also for uh, leadership for women. Um, and also, uh, you know, things like the negotiation workshop and other workshops she's also developing along the way. She's also a proud alum of MIT Sloan, and she had her doctor um, from BU uh, in material science and engineering. All right, so let's jump right in. So Nancy, so why don't you take over the screen and uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing, Daniel, and welcome everybody. Is Saturday morning, and I really appreciate some of you guys on the West Coast. Now it's almost 9 a.m., and I would need this an hour or 45 minute session. It's totally worth the time because we're going to cover very important topics for everyone. As we are speaking, please comment on the chat if you can see my screen or not. And during the entire session, if anybody have been to my live webinars before, you should, you should know that in general, I do lots of Q&A during the session. So I want people to engage through the chat. So if you can see my screen right now, comment on the chat and say, yes, you can see my screen. 
come in the chat and say yes. Okay, let me oh, see the chat. Uh, we see many yes, that's perfect. Okay, so let me, let's get started. Let me put all of you guys on top of my screen so we can see each other and put the chat as well. Okay, so today's topic is about negotiation. I've been teaching negotiation for a year from now on and since last year, I, I believe I gave a brief talk about negotiation to CBS PM members, specifically folks on uh, salary negotiation. Today, we talk about negotiation in general, especially during the pandemic. I know a few of you guys, maybe you're in the process of getting a job. So let's get started to understand how can we improve our negotiation skills. Specifically in this 45 minutes, I'm gonna show you how to advance your career and get what you want through negotiations and selling yourself strategies without leaving a bad impression. And Daniel already introduced myself. I just wanna emphasize a little more about negotiation part. I moved to the US with $800 in my pocket to study my PhDs in material science. Like most of you guys, I think lots of us already came into the US and trying to advance our career, but how can we get far along regarding a title and the career promotions? And in addition, how can we get more money out of this? So through my career, I each time I jump ship, I received uh, like 30%, 40% raise, but I also have had lots of failure at the very beginning of my career that was because I didn't ask for more money. That's that's why today I'm sharing lots of lessons learned with all of you guys. And some a, remem, uh, a reminder is that I have a YouTube channel talk about product management and also negotiation. You guys can search, just Google Dr. Nancy Lee and you're able to find lots of content about me and feel free to subscribe and learn more. And something I just really wanna let you guys know and because I really wish sometime in the future you can help me out with this mission. Why I'm teaching all of you guys today and why I give like many free seminars and speaking conferences once per month was because my long-term goal is to build 100 schools in China to teach kids from mid and low income families entrepreneurship. Um, I wish sometime in the future you guys can help me to achieve this long-term mission. So in the near term, why I focus on negotiation today was that now I have the opportunity to manage a team of senior product managers. What I found out was that women and the international professionals are not on the decision table, a uh, decision making table. That was because for example, when you're getting hired and there's many managers need to vote, do we need to hire this person? Do we need to sponsor H1B? Do we need to give this person a little, more, a little bit more money because he deserves more? If you are the only one, like me, I'm the only female manager out of 100 people product management organization. Besides me, there are only two Chinese managers in total out of 100. There are very few of us who is able to advocate for international professionals and sometimes women as well. So therefore, in general, very few of us are getting paid as much as our counterparts, our peers. And that's why I decided to teach negotiation to all of you guys today, how to negotiate and get more. So now let's get started regarding the general framework for negotiation is have a deep understanding of seven principles. First is your own interest is towards the both parties need to have the same interest towards the same deal. And the second is legitimacy and fear. See this very simple regarding each time you negotiate something. Think about you always need to make sure the deal is very fair instead of you're taking advantage of the other part, part, the other side of the party. And same thing as relationship building. I'm going to give you examples specifically how to build relationship even before you start negotiation. And during negotiation, when you think about our best alternative, to a negotiated agreement so that you can decide do you want to walk away or not. And, and the next is commitment. Both parties need to make commitment to close the deal. And finally is your communication style, specifically how would you communicate and share information with the other side of the party to land the deal together. So the seven principles today, I'm going to break this down to all of you guys and using specific case studies. And feel free to jump in, comment on the chat and today. So before we even dive into the details, so now let me ask you the specific questions. 
about what specific things do you guys want to negotiate when we mention this word negotiation? Comment on the chat. What do you want to negotiate and why you're here today? I assume you're, you try to get something out of negotiation, right? So Grace said promotion. Great. Yes. Promotion is part of the negotiation track that's related, but it's not the same. Yes. Negotiation can lead to promotion as well, especially in big, big companies. You need to know how to say and get more. Yeah. May says salary. Exactly. I think Lots of people think about salaries, new opportunities, right? Um, headcount, totally, yeah. We'll talk about this. Uh, myself as a hiring manager, I'm getting more headcount from I got my, my peers, my managers. How can you get more, right? And renting out your apartment. Daniel, that's amazing, awesome. Yeah, um, I'm renting out my own as well, actually. Yeah, how can you? Get a fair price for the rent. Negotiation with vendors, exactly. I have specific examples about this uh, with vendors. And actually something very interesting that is that an, a friend of mine, she's American, she moved to Germany. Just completely a new country. And when she started to work there, her, uh, uh, she of course negotiated her job offer when, when she accepted the job offer. And then the first day she joined the company, her boss said, I'm glad you negotiated, or I'll be very sad because you're going to negotiate with the vendors on behalf of the companies. So negotiations happens every day. Then like Danny said, visa, oh yeah. We should save the visa H1B issue towards the end, or you guys can jump in anytime. The specific things about H1B, lots of people made, made mistakes, yes. Visa, green card need to be negotiated in many different ways. We're gonna, hopefully we can cover as much as all the topics possible. Scope of work with client, yeah, if you're a consultant, you need to discuss the scope of work. And as a product manager myself, we, we talk about scope of work with, it's more like product definition. How would you prioritize different tasks? And it's all negotiation as well, exactly. So I'm glad everybody captured the nuance of negotiation, there's many, that actually negotiation happens every day to me. Like me, I, my fiance and I, who cleans the bathroom is also a negotiation, seriously. Okay, so now we know what can be negotiated. Let's come to the, the main part that as a fundamental, I want all of you guys to understand before you start any negotiation. The two types of negotiation, one is Distrib uh, how, to, uh, how to pronounce it? Distributive, distributive uh, negotiation. The other one is integrative negotiation. The way it works is that the one, the first one is more towards win lose. It's very straightforward. The second one is win win. The two different style. One style is that I want to get the maximum all of this negotiation. When you buy a house, right? When you like rent your apartment, do different things, or when you negotiate the scope of work, you want to get the maximum and the other side of the table start to lose. This is wrong in terms of the outcome because in the long run, as, as something we, we talk about the, the relationship in the middle, in the long run, we need to think about how can we create a win-win situation to build a long-term relationship so that the other side of a table that, that the parties can work with you again or negotiate new deals. It's all about how can you work together. And same thing as it's a joint game instead of individual games. Each time we negotiate, think about how can the other side of a table also get something out of this negotiation. Negotiation is a value exchange to me. And same thing, multiple parties is involved and also you need to negotiate multiple uh, uh, like uh, issues together. The one in the middle, multiple issues. What I mean is that when you, for example, you, when you negotiate a job offer, you don't just negotiate the base salary. You negotiate sign on bonus, maybe vacation time, maybe maternity leave. If some of you guys want to have kids in the future, it's a package of everything can be negotiated, not just one thing at the time. Of course, you need to be flexible and the outcome of negotiation, the solution should be very creative. That's in general the, the mindset I wanna set you guys when you walk into a negotiation table. 
Now, something I really want you to start to think about, change the definition of negotiation. When we talk about negotiation, do you feel like it's like a confrontational, very aggressive? If you're a woman, people might call you a B word, you know? So if you feel this way, do you have an active opinion about negotiation before this talk? And say yes in the chat. If negative, say yes. Oh, reverse. Okay, if negative, say N. If negative uh, opinion about negotiation in general, so N and uh, in the chat, or if you think, well, negotiation in general is a very positive term, you say uh, P in the chat. So comment on the chat and let me know what your original opinion about negotiation. So we see some positive. Oh my goodness, we see more positive than negative. That's awesome. Mm. Which means I'm going to switch the, the mindset part. I'm glad you guys already have positive opinion about negotiation. Yes. The first time I heard about negotiation is, is negative for me, honestly, because it's very aggressive. I don't want people to call me a bitch or whatever, you know? Um, but once I start to shift a mindset, negotiation is influence in real life, which means is that people do not pay for the value you deserve. People pay for the value you sell to them. Negotiation is a value exchange. If let's say you feel like you need to be a director, like people mentioned um, promotion, right? So recently I got like a four offers and also became a director. The name of company will be announced sometime in a week or so. Uh, but in general, when we talk about title, different things, you think you deserve a director title. Other people think mm, maybe not. What's because they didn't see the value you sell to them. It's not because you don't deserve it, okay? People never pay for what you deserve, they pay for the value you sell to them. So I'm gonna send this as we go through the examples. Oops. What do you think is negotiable? Now we talked about this earlier, right? So let me give you the answer regarding what's negotiable. We mentioned promotions and different things. And I also list more things, more than what you talk about, such as green card, equity exit package, especially if you move up to a uh, direct director or above level, director VP level, you need to talk about the exit package. Some companies let you do that, sometimes some companies do not, but you need to think about it. exit package means if you leave the company or somehow company let you go, whatever, they will give you half year salary because you know lots of top secrets of the company. So this is called part of the exit package people should think about it and uh, like legal contract, like who clean the dishes. As I said, I, I do this more often than anyone else and also discount on clothes. Uh, and something about discount clothes is very funny. Um, I negotiate 20% off at Macy's for the original price. Nothing was on sale. Original price, nothing was on sale. I got additional 20% off. This is all based on negotiation. I don't want to like get money. It's, it's not lots of money. Uh, but the sense behind this is that people need to practice negotiation. You cannot only ask for promotion, want to get a director title. You ask it once per year or once per like three years, something like that, but you're out of practice. That's why I encourage everyone to apply the principles and the practice on a daily basis or at least weekly basis. Okay, so second part is I really want to share, share with you guys this. I was an uh, engineer before. Um, data is something I really enjoy. The second part is you are as good as others. What I mean is that, so do this experiment with me very quickly. There was a specific study conducted in Stanford University. They put a group of people slash in half, randomly selected both men and women slash in half. For the first group, they told that for all of you guys, you're gonna negotiate on behalf of TJ Maxx. And women in the past are better at negotiating deals on behalf of TJ Maxx because women love fashion, right? And for the second group was randomly selected group of people, they said, you're going to negotiate on behalf of TJ Maxx, but in general, in the past, men are tough negotiators. They usually get a better deal because they're like, 
more dominant in the negotiation table. So my question to all of you guys is that who did better in those two separate groups? Men or women or the same? Or group one or group two? Just let me know the two scenarios. First group, they told women is better. Second group, they said men is better. Who did better in those experiments? Now, then I show data to you. Daniel says same for both groups. Uh, Grace said men, lots of men, men, men. Christina said women. So uh, uh, here's a hint. The two groups. First group, they told them something, that women is better. Second group, they said men are better. Two groups. Do you see both groups? Uh, women better or the men are better? Or group one is some the same so group one groups are the same okay we see lots of men and men women women lots of guesses actually let me share you the scientific results based on the chart for the group one women did better for group two men did better why so let me show you what's behind the scenes there's no difference between Group one, group two, because they're randomly selected. For the first group, because they put in the head saying that women are better, women did better. For the second group, they put in people's head saying that you are men, you can do better. And men did better. There's no difference between men and the women in those two groups. The only difference is that if I put pre-existing beliefs or conditions or influences in your head, then you will do better. From what I'm telling you this, based on the data I wanna share, show, uh, share with you is that you are as good as others. Even if you might be minority, even if you might speaking with accent like me, or even if you might be a woman, in general women are getting paid 80 cents on a dollar compared with men, right? Even if, People said you're worse, whatever. If you do not believe that you're, you're good or, or worse or whatever, it doesn't matter, women or, or minorities or immigrants can do as good as other people. So understand this before we move on, okay? This, your mindset really defines who you are and how well you do in negotiation. Now let's get into the specific framework and case studies, the how you apply those like, specific principles from universities in real life. All right, so let's do this. And when we negotiate, it's about the framework. There are four steps framework. Let's say you need to understand the right timing and also build relationship, reputation before you ask, research your market value, tell others about your value, right? We talk about value uh, driven negotiations the whole time. All I teach people is about value you can bring to the company. So let's break down the framework. I will also give you specific case studies. And step one is that build credibility before you ask, which means you need to socialize your achievement whenever it happens, such as product launch, engineering breakthrough, problem you have solved. Specifically myself, I am in the product side. So I, I emphasize on product launch and how many customers use my product and how much revenue my product has been driven by, uh, by by the customers and to the companies and all, all costs have been saved because my product those are all your achievement and people one of you guys mentioned promotion part of something you can negotiate not just promotion salary everything together right so when those achievement happen you need to start to build your credibility and talk about your achievement especially in the american environment don't wait until December, hey, I had achievement in the summer, do you remember? No, no, no. When something happened in the summer, talk about it, let people know, build your credibility way before you ask. Second is build your personal brand before you ask. What I mean is that everyone has a brand. You should ask yourself what's your brand, right? So the way it works is that ask yourself and ask you others work with you. How other people describe you? If someone describe you as this person very, is very confident, she's a problem solver, she's a leader, she's on track to become a director or VP in the future, whatever you, whatever you want to achieve, I, I don't care, you define what your final goal is, right? So you need to build your personal brand 
even before you start negotiation. If you are known for someone who's a pushover, someone also get lots of things done, someone also work 60, 80 hours per week and never push back, do you think you will win in negotiation? No. You don't even comment on the chat on this. Of course, it's no, right? Unless it's different. If you think it's different, you say on the chat, right? So personal brand is important before you even start asking. Now, we also need to do lots of preparation before you start asking. Negotiation happens months before you start asking. Now, set your aspiration price and bottom line. In the principles, we have something towards alternative solutions and like what your, what your best options, different uh, like uh, like uh, offers on the table, things like this. Let's use salary negotiation as an example. The same thing applies to anything you want to negotiate. Negotiate with vendors. Do your research regarding your aspiration price and bottom line. For example, if you negotiate salary, you can Google regarding search. I'm getting an offer from Facebook. How much? Facebook getting paid with this, this many of years experience, right? The specific website that I recommend everyone to check out called Blind, Google this Blind. They also have an app, basically anonymous, anonymous site. I think they are super up version compared with uh, glass doors. So this is better. I, I think the, 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 the number there is also very, very recent and it's not old data anyway. So search what the market value is so understand aspiration price means, well, this is how much Facebook PM getting paid on the market today. And I want actually a little bit higher than that. This is my aspiration price. Bottom line is, well, let's say, I know, I know, I, I know lots of like, uh, people's salary. Just give you some examples. Facebook a product manager with like, uh, let's say 10 years or like five years experience, they're getting paid 300 grand. You, if your aspiration price is, mm, I think I have 12 years experience, I should get a little bit more. So my aspiration price is 330 grand per year, total package. Well, your bottom line is, mm, well, if they gave me anything above 250, I will consider accepting an offer. Of course, the higher is the better, right? But my bottom line is 250. Anything below 250, I think I would just work for Amazon or a better company and cooler company. I think like that. You need to understand your aspiration price, your bottom line, through market research, through your own soul searching and understand what you have, what you want. Now, let me show you some specific examples and where the money coming from, right? So how much a product manager get paid? People ask me these questions all the time. This, you can use this as a reference check for your specific professions and search those online blind, other places, because I specialize in product management, so I know all the numbers behind it. I put a manager getting paid at 120 to, one, uh, to 300 in total. This, done, this do not include startups. Startup get paid low, but give you way more equity. So, but you might be the next Google or next Facebook company. You don't know. So this startup is wild card. Uh, and then you break down those salary for product managers. On in general, you get you you get paid a monthly ten grand to twenty five grand, and sign on bonus could vary between five k to ten to one hundred grand. Um, just for the side note, I help an, uh, three days ago. I help another student of mine uh, negotiating her salary with uh amazon so amazon paid her sign on bonus of 100 grand so this is examples uh in reality so once you know all the data you can set a realistic your aspiration number your bottom line what can be negotiated don't go above what people can offer but you know in general what they can offer that's very good data for you before you start negotiation okay now let me ask you this question. So something wrong with, okay, you come up with specific numbers. This is your salary negotiation as an example, right? You come up with the best uh, numbers. Now, before you even walk into the negotiation, you should also collect information from something else. What's your best alternative solutions? What I mean is that you drop as an example means if I do not take Amazon's offer, what, what, what else on the table, right? You can stay in your current company. This is also other best alternative solutions. 
and someone mentioned regarding like vendors or promotions, right? Let's say promotion, if you cannot get director position, my, my other best alternative solution is get a job something else, somewhere else with the same title or something, right? Or you, you negotiate with vendors, you say, well, vendor one is too expensive, but they're really good. But my other best alternative solution is this, right? So let me ask you this, uh, this questions. When you st start negotiating, have you thought about your best alternative solutions? Let's use your job as an example. If you went in, put in the chat, if you went into a, like an interview process, then someone like Facebook make you an offer, but they give you a low bar offer. What's your best alternative solutions compared with a Facebook offer? Comment on the chat. Use that as an example. You were product manager or in data scientist. You go to Facebook and they make an offer, but you kind of didn't like it somehow. Maybe, maybe you don't like the reputation of the company. And what's your best alternative offer or solutions? What's your best alternative solutions in this specific scenario? What else you can come up with? Comment on the chat. What's your best alternative solutions? Yeah, keep searching for new jobs, exactly. Do you have any more answers? Counter offer, yes, you can bring counter offer in the negotiation process, exactly. That's your other best alternative solutions, exactly. Stella, you, you, you hit it right. So all of this could be other alternative solutions. Think about your other alternative solutions. This will be very strong a counterpart when you go into this negotiation. Sometimes I want to stay in my current company. It's not bad to stay in my current company. It's comfortable, stable, whatever. This is also something uh, great when you can think about it. Yeah, ask for promotion in your current company. Exactly. Tailor the scope of your work. Yeah. You can do more, do less. And it's also your attorney solutions. Even if you don't work for Facebook, you don't accept the job offer, there are other things, right? And uh, yeah, be specific what I can offer and add value, Grace. Grace, you, you, you keep something, you learn so quickly because I, uh, my entire negotiation strategy is about value you can add to employers. Awesome. All right, so let's keep going. You also need to understand what's on the, the other side of the table, right? You understand what's your best alternative solutions, how much getting paid, how much other company getting paid, the entire package you can negotiate. Now what's on the other side of the table is that what about the company, right? So especially if you negotiate with a startup, you need to understand the funding situation of startup. You also need to understand for a big company, what's their budget? There's a range. The budget can never go above like 250 in total, whatever, things like that. Or is there any other competition on the table? You might, they, they might select you and compare you with other vendors, compare you with other candidates, anything could happen, right? So understand what's on the other side of the table is going to help you frame the entire process. You can't just be in your own zone and say, oh, I want this much money. Well, if 10 other candidates want way less, especially during COVID, probably the more candidate than ever. You want 300 grand, Facebook's like, mm, there are lots of candidates who doesn't have a job. They're willing to sell themselves cheap for 250. Let me take someone else who's willing to sell them, them cheap during COVID, right? So this is something you guys need to consider, especially when you negotiate during COVID for promotions, other things as well. Now, Saturday negotiation tips, and you guys should do a screenshot. Um, I just want to cover this very quickly. Is that it is illegal for HR to ask your current salary in Massachusetts? I don't know other cities or, or other states. So if your current salary is lower, the same thing in California, exactly. So this is very good protection. If your current salary is lower than your future jobs, don't tell them. Tell them it is illegal for you to ask me how much I'm getting paid right now. Okay, not legal to ask current company. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Sometimes HR still asks you, you tell them what I said on the screen, it is illegal for you to ask me how much 
I'm getting paid right now. I'm just trying to protect you. You're again, you're doing something against law, right? Don't tell them your current salary, unless your current salary is much higher than they're, they're willing to pay, then you have more. But usually I assume when you jump ship, your current salary is lower than what they offering you. So don't tell them your lower salary. Same thing as get a, ask your ex coworkers for salary information, go or rent it, ask and many different things. Yeah, those are all the tips you guys should consider when you ask for more. So today it's more towards the uh, like negotiation. Now let me give you a specific example regarding value driven negotiation, right? So a friend of mine, actually she was my, uh, my student last year. I helped her to, got, uh, to get a 40% raise, just use hers as an example. And the value, we use value-driven approach. And let me define her value. That first of all, so this, she's a senior scientist. She used to work for startup in San Francisco. Now she's jumping to, the last year, she, at that time, she jumped to another startup. But crazy part is that she got a low bar offer. Low bar offer means to protect her information. Let's say you get 100K base. In California, it's much higher than that. Let's just use 100 as an example, right? So you, when you guys can come on the chat as well and use some random number as an example when you ask questions as well so that we can be very specific. I want all of you guys to take uh, the content and something you can take actions right away, okay? So let's use real number I, I, or I, some numbers as an example. Like for her, let's say her base salary today, her base salary for her current company is 100 grand, but the new company offer her exact the same base salary. That's, that's awful. I call that low ball offer. Whenever you jump ship, you get the same money. No, even if the other company is cooler, you need to get paid more, right? So my student felt like very undervalued. I, I would feel offended. I feel offended if this happened to me. Never happened to me, but happened to her. She, low bar offer. You come to my company, you make exactly the same as what you had before. And then what we did was that we, we did market research. Let's say in San Francisco, the material scientist uh, salary is total package 120 to 150. And it's definitely it's a low bar offer. So we understand how much the market should be and uh, combine her years of experience. Then the next thing, oops, uh, the next thing we did is that understand the fundraising situation of the startup. Basically, she's jumping from startup A to startup B, but the startup B just raised 300 grand, I'm sorry, $300 million, sorry, it's not grand, $300 million uh, was great work-life balance. They also take every other Friday off. My point is based on all the funding situation, uh, and uh, actually you can find review on Glassdoor as well. So this company in general pay people very well, and they do have lots of funding being able to like, pay her. So it's clearly there is lots of room for growth. Now, her value, right? And this value to the startup is she already had experience in 90% of the equipment she's, she needs to use as a material scientist in the new company. She also had experience leading a team, and she also had many PhD publications. That's all her value she can bring to the startup. What she did next is that she talked to HR and asked, oops, asked specific questions. And specifically what she started conversation was because this is the value I can bring to the company. That with me, you're able to accelerate the material testing process 50% faster, whatever, because my experience working with 90% of equipment, so that's her value she can bring to the company, that how much this is going to help company to improve and grow their bottom line, their revenue, their operation efficiency. And in addition, she also told HR saying, that I really like your company. This is my top choice. So how can we work together? How do you, what do you think the hiring manager want? So the key part behind is, again, remember the principle building relationship. She's building relationship with HR. Because HR also wants you to accept the offer, but HR just like give you a low ball offer. That's very, uh, I, I wouldn't feel happy to see that either, but she, they still want to hire you. So she is trying to build relationship with HR and bring HR on her side and ask HR to give her more information to understand what, what, what exactly the hiring manager wants and what's, um, what the range of the company we can work on. I, this is my top choice, but this is, 
definitely too low than what I expected, but I like your company, right? So the entire relationship building process let her know much more information. Um, we hear some noise. Daniel, do you want to mute? Yeah. Yeah, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, you can let Daniel know so we can unmute you you when you talk. Um, yeah, so let's continue. And specifically, after she understood the entire like re her value to the company build relationship with HR, and she got a forty percent raise based on her offer. And in addition, I also think the company is way cooler. She used to work for a bike company as a material scientist. Now she's making flying cars as a material scientist. So I also think it's, it's also title bump, all bump in many different ways, right? So this is the final outcome regarding how she uses value-driven approach to build relationship with HR and have them, have her, have the HR to help her. Now, let me give you another value-driven examples. Um, this is also a real case. This, I just covered this, uh, the picture and to protect the identity of another student of mine. She's a real estate agent, let's call her Megan. And okay, if you're in California like Daniel, do not laugh at the numbers, okay? Do not laugh at how much things are getting sold in Boston, in suburb. I know we're missing a zero, okay? In California, it's probably $6 million. In Boston suburbs, it's probably 600 grand, okay? We're talking about suburb of Boston, 600 grand, single family. So what happened was, for Megan, she helped her client to sell a, a house, single family in the suburb of Boston. Original price was 600 grand. She sold for 700 in a cash offer. 700 cash offer, immediate closing, that's amazing, but she's only getting 1% of commission. That was because originally she needed to give money to uh, the buyers, this buyer's seller. She's a seller's agent. She also needs to give half of commission to the buyer's agent. She also needs to like uh, do a demo, the house, do other stuff. So she's only getting 1%. 1% is $6,000. She's only getting six thousand dollars, doing such amazing job for the for the uh, for the client, and then we work on the value she can bring to her client. Her value to her client is one hundred grand more. It was six hundred. Now she sold it for seven hundred. Her value to client is one hundred grand more, and she her asking was that hey, given I'm bringing you so much value, I deserve additional one percent. In the past, I get $6,000 or $7,000, 1%, given my value to you significant higher. I, I think you need to reward me with one more percentage, which is seven, another $7,000, which means the total value she bring to her client is like $93,000 for client. So she focus on the value she can bring to the client, which also makes so much sense. And they still want to build long-term relationship to continue work with each other. So that's how she bring her value, talk about her value during the negotiation process. Now, let me ask you one last question before we re-end this talk and go to the Q&A part is that when do you think you should ask for a raise? Comment on the chat. When do you think you should ask for a raise? Come on the chat. Uh, in New York. Mm. Is, it, is this a delayed message in New Yes, in New York, it's illegal to ask your current comp. Yes, uh, great comment. And Megan said, just finished a big project with great outcome. When do you think ask for race? That's one of the answers. That's good one. Uh, uh, what else do you guys think? When do you think you should ask for race? Quarterly catch up. Yeah, that's one of the answers. Very cool. You guys don't ask for raise. We need to get more. Get us offers. Yes. When do you have achievement and get or, uh, recognized by the team? Great said that. Awesome. Yeah, those are all great answers. But something I need to bring all of you guys' attention to is the timing. Uh, I'm feeling have sufficient experience. Yes. Let me show you the specific timing. I talk about the negotiation calendar I built for all of you guys, is that for lots of companies, the decisions were made about your, your next year's bump is the like uh, November. Then in December, you have performance review session, which means you need to ask your salary like bump 
way ahead the decision was made. Don't wait until December. You do it in like September or sometime earlier. And I wouldn't ask for raise whenever you have a huge like accomplishment during the major project. I would use that to build your reputation first. And then three months later, and you ask for a raise. When you can build your reputation, have your allies, have all the dots on down the line, and you then you ask the time specifically at the right decision making time of your company. But don't wait until December. So I built actually I made a specific uh, video about specific how to find out the negotiation timeline of your company. I also have I made a negotiation like a calendar. And that's specifically how I asked my first 15% uh, raise in my first company. And you can take a screenshot of this page and you can scan this barcode, which will land you to like, download the sheet. And also I had a link to the specific videos you guys can watch. I will also put my uh, YouTube uh, video link here. So there's a lot of videos you can watch about negotiation. For, uh, for today, this is something uh, I want to share with all of you guys. Now we can actually go to, because for the sake of time, we can spend more time in Q&A for, for that part based on what you uh, emphasize on. And the final thought I want to bring to all of you guys is that investing in yourself is the only thing with guaranteed returns. You got to believe this, that this is also very data-driven, something's crazy. And also I, I learned this through my, my, my teaching experience is that the, the difference between successful people and the mediocre people or, or okay, whatever people we can talk about is that successful people are more willing to invest in themselves. The specific examples I wanna give you guys is that when I started teaching negotiation last year, the, I, I, I want to teach women because women need it more. They are, we're getting paid like 80 cents on a, on a dime, on a dollar. And then there's a lot of men reach out to me. It's crazy. It was like, why on earth, men, you reach out to me about negotiation? And, and you're already doing better than women and you want to reach out to me. And some men even reach out to me asking me this, not just for more money, more salary. They ask me this, Nancy, how can I negotiate with my fiance about when to get married? Men see this as negotiations happens everywhere, even if they are already doing better, they want to improve themselves. And same thing as another student of mine was so crazy. They are the, the what a VP of product and, and trying to learn from me regarding the, the product management bootcamp I'm teaching. I was like, you're the VP of product. What the heck? Why on earth are you here today? And they were like, Nancy, you are better at product management, selling yourself, negotiation. I want to learn the specific skills from you so that I can even make more money and get promoted, promotion even faster. Was, wow, that's how rich, com uh, rich people become richer and successful people become more, success. uh, more successful was because they're more willing to invest in themselves. This is also learning, like surprise learning outcome I discovered. So therefore, I suggest all of you guys is that the only way, the only thing to have guaranteed returns is investing in yourself. Um, everything else, the stock market, everything can go, go up and down like crazy. It's not very predictable, but the only thing you can predict is investing in yourself. This is my final words for all of you guys. If you want to get in touch with me, you can take a screenshot right now with all my contact information. Um, you can find me on WeChat, and I also have a specific uh, WeChat group that you can scan this barcode and join the group uh, which also have my like website also have a wechat account where i post product management like uh, interview tips and the career advice there and basically it's all my content you can you can contact me later on just at the final word i teach product management interview bootcamp i also negotiate offer on behalf of other people if you're interested feel free to email me or message me on wechat um, thank you very much for your time. So now let's move to Q&A session. Feel free to, I don't know, tell Daniel or put your questions here. Daniel is going to manage the Q&A session. I'm going to turn this back to him. All right, appreciate it. Um, so I think this is a great talk. Uh, I think that's a great example of putting together the series, uh, the framework, the seven steps, seven elements of negotiation and with your real life examples. Um, 
And I think that uh, the value-based um, negotiation try to really, you know, make sure the other party understands the value. And also your emphasis emphasis on the relationship building, uh, I think really kind of resonate with my past experience as well. So um, before getting to uh, any of the additional questions I have here on the panel discussion, uh, someone, uh, I think it's named TA, um, asked this question about, because uh, I think this is related to back to what you mentioned earlier. Um, when promotion mm. decision was made, mm. uh, you know, is it before you fill out your own performance review? So my, from my perspective, the answer is yes. Um, so the mm. performance review was something we asked the team to fill out by December, sometime end of November, but the decision was made back in end of October or begin November when we planned the budget. So, um, so does that make it entirely useless? Um, I think that wouldn't make it entirely useless. It wouldn't render the whole effort useless, but it's still, you know, kind of tell you the timing is important back to Nancy's point. Um, so I, I think Nancy, I don't, I don't want to hijack the discussion. So I want you to address that question specifically. Um, the fact that the decision was made before you filled out the performance review, do you still need to spend time on the performance review? Is there still an effort that's worth you know, focusing on? So back to you. Yeah, you should always highlight your achievement in all the performance review 200%. So it's not a waste of effort because Whereas what, which deck that I mentioned, one of the deck I mentioned is always about how can you like socialize and build your brand, make people understand you, given you already missed the timing. Again, hey guys, like seriously, so watch this video and, and take a screenshot of this. It will, it, will take, it will take you to download the negotiation calendar where you can learn more. But what I mean is that you should have asked in different timing long time ago, but you didn't. Now, it's your turn to socialize, even if decision was made, you should still socialize. Take all the opportunities to socialize your achievement, even if it's too late. It's very likely the decision was made, you're, you're, doesn't, make, doesn't move a needle, doesn't make you get even more, one more dollar. But it's still a good, good exercise to do because you also need to practice socializing. But you do need to understand like, what Daniel said. And I think Daniel himself, he also managed people as a manager or like, giving people races, right? All the decision was made before your performance review. So that's why I, I made a specific video. You guys gotta watch this and understand how people make decisions in big companies. Yeah, correct, thank you. Um, I think that's uh, it's very helpful. Um, I think you know, the calendar is you know, something you wanna keep in mind of. Um, when you write your performance review, it's not for this year's. Uh, it's something that kind of reminds your boss, reminds your manager um, you know, what you did, what, what is the impact so you're setting up the basis for the next year's budget. So basically that's a, uh, just be, just keep in mind that, you know, whatever you write, you know, it's going to generate immediate value. You know, it's going to be a long-term investment, assuming you're going to stay in the company for a, a while. Right. So that's mm -hmm. a, that's a key point. And then also the timing, um, personally, from my perspective, uh, I would like to bring it up at the quarterly catch up. Um, so you, usually if you have, I mean, you should, everyone should have their, uh, you know, non project based, career development session with your boss and sometimes skip level too, right? So every once in a while, you should talk to them about your career aspiration, what works for you, what doesn't work for you, um, you know, and what's your long-term, say four or five years uh, career goal and also what is your short-term career goal? So those are things that's kind of transcend, up, you know, on top of what we have, you know, on, on, on those weekly one-on-one -on -one discussion about your project, right? So you should have a session with your boss, not about project, but only about your career aspiration. Tell them explicitly where you want to be and ask, your, ask for help, how you can get there, right? So, so I think those discussions you need to have uh, ahead of time. And like Nancy mentioned, don't just wait till once a year uh, and a performance review, because that will be a little too late. Maybe that will impact next year's uh, you know, performance review, but it's going to be a little too late. You're going to have to wait for another 12 months or so. All right. Yeah. So um, I want to kind of get back to, so I collected a bunch of questions um, mm -hmm. you know, from, your, uh, from everyone's uh, Eventbrite sign up. So there's a question about, hey, what do you want to learn from the negotiation ses session? So uh, I'm going to run through some examples here or some of the questions you have, uh, consolidate all of them into four buckets. And I'm going to return back to the screen um, afterwards um, to talk about some of the questions you guys have specifically. But first thing is, you know, in terms of the uh, negotiation types, I know we have the distributive and we also had integrative, right? Distributive where it, it's a zero sum game. You're talking about a single number. And the, uh, the integrative is, you know, you know, you're having a lot of multiple um, conditions you're negotiating on. And you typically can achieve win-win as long as you know what is valuable to you and what is valuable to your party, to your, to your uh, counterparty. So 
does win win truly exist for salary negotiation? You know, usually talking about a single number,、um, but can you achieve a win win that preserves the relationship and also,、uh, you know, get what you wanted? But you know, finding out a creative solution, right? Because with typically a distributive negotiation, there's no nothing creative about that, right? You're talking about a single number and you're pushing back and you know back and forth the bar where it, where it ended at. But with the salary negotiation, can you have a win win situation where you can come up with creative solutions? Yeah, actually, I、uh, this specific example I want to give you guys. It happens a lot. For example, three days ago, I helped somebody to negotiate、um, AWS offer with Amazon.、Uh, AWS is Amazon, same thing to me.、Um, let's run the number. We don't want to talk my client's number. Let's say two hundred, but it's higher than that. Just just use that as an example. Her, she's getting paid higher than that, right? The specific number. Let's say the the. Uh, recruiter gave her two hundred grand. Original gave her, let's say, one eighty total package. Now give her a two hundred, whatever. Then、um, what we thought is that well, this might be a zero sum game regarding salary negotiation. However, the way not to make it zero sum game is you package it as a whole thing. Maybe if your in your salary package there are relocation package, sign on bonus. For Amazon, they also have equity. Within equity, they also have the the vesting period, which means the first year they give you ten、uh, percent, second year give you twenty five percent, whatever the vesting period. These all random numbers. I can give you the real number just as an example, right? Um, they also have the 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 cash the cash sign on bonus and stock options sign on bonus and、uh, not just sign on bonus annually. They give you that much money. All this is a package. It is not a win lose. And the way you do that is if the the maximum base salary for Amazon is this much, which we know, we know all the numbers. I know all the numbers. That is that. Let's say the base salary for Amazon maximum we can push is one sixty. So why push one sixty? Because gonna hurt the relationship between you and the HR. What we push is is how can we push the The relocation package more, right? Give me more money to move there, right? It's it's it's, it's a far move to me, especially you want to move during COVID or after COVID. It's, it's high risk for you to move, right? So this is a win-win situation that way. From recruiters' perspective, they have different budgets. So myself, I'm hiring manager. I understand how budget was allocated. They are they have budget for like base salary, budget for relocation, or budget for like stock options, different things. Is that As long as your budget do not go beyond what they can control, it's all like、uh, negotiable, and it's a win-win. Was because the recruiter really want her to join the company. What she can work on is well, the base salary cannot be improved. The stock option is the maximum. How can give her more money to relocate or what to move here? Eventually, she still got the maximum number. Uh, we can get together. We're very, we're very proud. Like total numbers she she got in total. So it is a win-win situation, even towards salary negotiation, because the whole package is very valuable that you can talk about. Yeah, very helpful.、Uh, thank you, Nancy. I think from my personal examples,、um, I think even if the number is set, a hundred percent set, like you just no wiggle rooms、um, to make the number larger. There's also creative solutions too. So for for my case,、um, specifically,、uh, you know, I asked for. Part of my future bonus or part of my sign-up bonus to be paid for with tuition. So basically, you know, imagine this: like, you know, you're paying, I'm say, you know, a year of MBA tuition at seventy thousand dollars or so, and then you ask them to, hey, don't pay me cash on my bonus or don't pay me cash on my sign-up bonus, hold it off, and then just pay the school directly, right? So there's also from that perspective, you're also saving a lot of income taxes. So so、yeah. there's a lot, lot of win-win situation, a lot of creative solutions. You can think of for company, it's all the same money. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't cost them anything. There might be some accounting overhead where people had to work it through. You know, put that into a different GL line item. But in reality, you know, it doesn't cost company much to get you what you want, and also for them, they're not losing much either. So there's always going to be creative solutions out there.、Um, same thing with the uh, 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 the sign up bonus. Sometimes if you need to move across the coast, you can ask them, hey, give me less sign up bonus, but cover more on the relocation package because again, that's You pay directly to the moving company, right? So again, you don't have to go through this income tax.、Um, you know, basically taking the venture of un- Uncle Sam and and not worry about like those money being charged like whatever、uh, at forty percent,、um, you know, prehold、uh, ta- you know, tax rate. 
So there's always things you can think about in, in terms of a creative solutions. All right, yeah. so um, I want to move on to uh, the next section, which is like you know, more of a nurturing uh, of the relationship and also being aware of, um, of the culture difference. So first of all, Nancy, uh, are you aware uh, or what is the main difference between you know, negotiating in the United States and negotiating in China? I think this actually came, this question came from one of the audience, you know, from the Eventbrite uh, when they sign up. So are you familiar with like, you know, what is the culture difference between different negotiation styles when you're talking with, you know, a counterparts um, from China versus from US? I do not negotiate with the specific companies. Oh, actually I negotiated with, um, with Alibaba before actually when they want me to move back and give me some, some uh, money to move there, right? I, I, my, I personally think is that for uh, American, it's more creative. I think they can help you to work on different things. For Chinese company, there's a rule book you need to check. There's a specific number you need to hit. For American, for example, this happened before that if some company, some person will really want to hire, you can escalate to ask for more money through different ways because they really want you to get there. For, for Chinese company, I think they treat you more towards commodity. That sounds really bad. Uh, but it, it's that you're, you're more replaceable. This is the n number, you don't want it, we move on to the next person. Um, that's how I see this, the differences. The creativity part is different. And uh, I also, if you negotiate in person with Chinese, it's more towards when you negotiate with, with, with things, not, not for money, with, negotiate for deals with other people. Um, I think the differences is that um, sometimes when you go to with Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese companies, uh, they might take it more personally compared with American. I think American, they, they negotiate more than us. They negotiate all the time. So oh, we'll try this. Doesn't work. Fine. For Chinese, they may feel like more emotional attached to it. Might hurt some like personal feelings or hurt their confidence. For American, I, I don't think they will, sometimes they didn't get what they want through negotiation. They don't, won't hurt their confidence. Well, they move on to negotiate next deal. I think that's the difference. What do you think, Daniel? Um, honestly, I don't have experience negotiating in China, so I can't really say, but <clears throat> from salary negotiation, you know, house negotiation, you know, all the things happening here, um, I think you just really want to take, I, I think you're right, uh, kind of you want to take the, re the, the emotion out of this, um, this uh, the, the exchange, right, the value exchange and the, and the information exchange. Um, so sometimes, I, I don't know if that happened in China a lot, but in here, um, sometimes if you're not a professional negotiator and your counterpart is not a negotiator, it's not a professional negotiator, um, I think it's very common to, you know, bring in the agency, bring in some kind of agent as, a, as an intermediary. Um, so I think that's what happened with, you know, with my current job, uh, where I got this job offer from a uh, executive recruiter. And then through talking to them about the salary and my expectation for the comp and for them to relay that information to the hiring manager, you know, it preserved the relationship between me and the hiring manager because I'm still working here, right? So basically you want to make sure that there's, you know, through that negotiation on the numbers and such, if you can find someone to talk on your behalf or into, you know, be acting as an intermediary, that's actually always better to preserve the relationship. That's my personal experience. Obviously not everyone had that opportunity uh, with salary negotiation, but when you always, I guess it's an example with house purchase, right? You always have an agent that's talking on your behalf with the buyer agent, with the seller agent. So you don't face with the, uh, uh, you don't talk to the, uh, the, the people directly who sell in the house because people get emotionally attached and you yeah. might really easily offend the other the counterparts. Yeah. Uh, actually, yesterday I closed the house. <laughs> I have lots of stories. Oh, <laughs> congrats. About, like, uh, negotiation with, for properties. Congratulations. <laughs> um, obviously, like people are asking, like, how do you find agent to, to negotiate offers? You usually, um, if you work with a recruiter, um, the recruiter will work with you to negotiate. So do not talk to your hiring manager directly about the money. That's my personal um, experience. But if you can find a recruiter, either from the company's perspective, that's like less neutral, right? Because they're talking about, you know, making the best, the most out of their end. But if you can also work with a third party independent contractor, sorry, independent recruiter to start off with, uh, the person that presented your resume to the hiring manager, to the HR, um, that person is usually, you know, work with them to tell them what you need and you know, that person has a incentive to close the deal because their compensation is based on your commission, based on if you get hired as a you know, uh, VP director or whatever, they usually get paid you know, uh, quite a bit, you know, up to 100K or even, even higher 
you know, per transaction. So work with those people because, because your goal is aligned, right? They want to make sure you accept the offer. Um, obviously for you, you want to get the highest offer. So um, there is a slight, you know, deviation from, you know, from the goal perspective, but in, in general, you know, when you work with, when you work with a, uh, a recruiter that present resumes to the company, especially for positions a little higher up, um, that's, a, that's a typical way to preserve the relationship with your manager directly after you start working. All right, um, I think I have a couple more questions about the relationship side. So uh, how do you negotiate, and again, this came from a question from the Eventbrite, uh, how do you negotiate with people that have more power than you? So the power balance um, is, is imbalanced, right? So the, 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 uh, uh, I guess if, if you're talking about your manager, you're talking about your boss, or people that have, just have more influence, have higher um, uh, badna, um, basically, like in that particular case, how do you negotiate with those people that you don't have as much influence and don't have as much, much power? Like how do you yeah. get yourself prepared for that situation? Actually, this happens a lot. And myself, I negotiate salaries even before that. Use salary as an example because you use it as your boss has more power than you. There are many different ways to do it. Is that, for example, my first job, I asked for a raise. I got 15% raise in my first job without jumping ship. Jumping ship is easier because you might have competing offers. Let's say in the situation you stay in your current company, and that year I got the 15% raise and also uh, the high, second highest bonus in my company. The way you negotiate with someone with, with, with higher power is that step one, you understand that what on earth this higher power person has on his table. On one, you might ask for more money, but he might compare your salary with your peers. There's some equations he's calculating why he or she doesn't deserve this money or why we, we, we cannot give her a, a, a promotion, something like that, right? So understand what's in his head. Then you can crack the equation. Step two is that find allies. When you try to negotiate with someone who is higher up, like find allies who can sponsor you in the current company that can either fishing out information from his head or talk to him directly on behalf of you. So this happens a lot. Actually, I asked my first company to sponsor me to go to MIT and have them to pay for my tuitions. I asked for four times. And my uh, specific MIT classes was in the middle of the day. I, I went to class 11 to 1 or 10 to 12, something like that. It definitely impacted my work for sure. Managers would say no. They do have higher power. And also the youngest one in the, in the company didn't really care about me, like personally, honestly. I can be replaced. That's my point, right? But if you're able to find other allies that can talk on behalf of you, and talk to the managers or understand what the managers has is important. And third, understand the budget. If your company or your, your manager do not have the budget, right? Or, or he need to ask for his VP or like EVP, whatever, to get additional budget. You understand how hard this is. And then you understand why, whether, uh, why I cannot ask for more or whether there's room for me to ask for more. And is the reality or have I hit the ceiling? Sometimes you already hit the ceiling, you hit the band. If you already know that you hit the band, you feel happy that you're the highest anyway. That, that also means that you, you cannot ask for more. Uh, and the, the final option is that the way to gain power in this situation is can you get other competing offers or to improve your, your current situation compared with someone with higher um, All right. Thank you, Nancy. And then I have one more question on the, uh, the nurturing the relationship side. Um, is it appropriate to review your BANA, your best alternative solution uh, to the negotiated agreement? So is it okay to review, hey, what's your backup plan to your counterparts? Because that's, you know, that's a tricky question, right? I think that you have your own BANA, you have your own um, you know, reservation price, and also what you can do with, you know, if this agreement does not go through. But is it okay to review that to the counterparty? The answer is always okay to review, but you need to use wisely. So for example, if you are, let, let's use the example as uh, an, another student of mine. If you have other counter offer from Google, that's my best alternative solutions, but you also have offer from Facebook, 
of course, and show them and tell them during the negotiation part, tell them I have other offers, they have this much, and can you can you can you beat this, right? So I think it's is okay, but you should also get ready if you reveal uh, your banner and they say no, and you have to get ready to walk away. So they know too much information, they know everything on your side, they still try to somehow do not give you what you want. Are you ready to walk away? So this is the last resort before I really show them all the cars in my hand. But this is one of the ways to do it. I think works is, is efficient. I, I did it myself as well. Push push offers really high. You guys compete and someone just made me an even higher offer. So all works out, but use it wisely. All right. Um, and then uh, I think this is very relevant. Um, so I think from my perspective, I think it's, it's really dependent on, is this the relationship that's worth nurturing? Like for example, if I'm selling my car, right, to this person I'm never ever ever gonna see again, you know, I think it's okay to review your banner. It's okay to say, hey, you know, if you don't buy it, I'm gonna sell to dealer for whatever uh, amount of money, right? And if this person that I care about is a long-term relationship I'm building with my boss, I'm not gonna tell him, hey, if you don't give me this, uh, what I wanted, I'm gonna walk away to go to this, this new company I already have an offer with, right? This is, you don't just review your banner directly with, with the relationship you would like to preserve. Um, but so you gotta, you gotta find your, find your sweet spot, find your battle. I like don't, it's not everything is worth fighting for. Um, sometimes it's okay to preserve more relationship to give up a little less. Um, sometimes you really don't care about relationship. You want to go all in, um, to win that battle. So I think that's yeah. just from my personal experience. Exactly. In, in that case, if you tell your boss, you have a competing offer, you got to give me this much money. If your boss didn't make it happen, you should get ready to leave because Correct. they look down on you. Correct. So, oh, huh. They, they look down on you if they give them, give you what you want. So use it wisely. This is a very dangerous tool, can get you lots of money or, or what you want, can also hurt you as well. Yep. Um, and I think what I'm going to move on to the next section regarding the, uh, the, the fourth section. So it's, it's going to be more around the visibility and the influence. So we just had a session last, uh, last time about the uh, leading team, leading effective teams. And also about um, something about influence. I will have more influence sessions later, later, later on. But as you mentioned, um, you know, negotiation is also influence too. So this is kind of like overlap, which is fine. So some question coming uh, that came from the uh, uh, the ten attendants um, are: How do I demo my value, and how do I demo leadership in my daily work, um, and how do I increase my visibility in the organization so people take notice, um, so the discussion about promotion doesn't come too late. Very good question. This is more towards uh, the promotion and influence side to, to get ahead in the organization. And myself had experiment, lots of different things. And the conclusion for that is that, first of all, whenever you have any kind of achievement, you gotta let people know. And the second, you also need to grasp a, a relation, uh, opportunity to give public speaking, like speeches, sorry, public speeches. What it means is that if, there's a product launch or something, or any like uh, you build a data model. You need to get and fight for the opportunities to give a presentation. So you're perceived as the leader in that space, even if you collaborated with other people. So get those opportunities. And the second is that build your network in the company to understand where can you find those high profile opportunities in the company and for example for me i, I know where is uh, the most high profile comp like uh, jobs or project that's important to the executives in my in my current company and you just need to build the network you have and identify those opportunities and work on things like that and now the other part is also you mentioned about influence and demonstrate your leadership skills and Influence and demonstrating leadership skills, and they are coming hand to hand. What I mean is that when you start influencing people, is about how can you understand the true motivation of the other side of like the table, that that person. How would you able to say things to his heart that he cares about? And then, and leadership also has a lot to do with whether you're perceived as a leader. And usually the person who gives more presentation is perceived as a leader, and also the person who is leading the meetings are perceived as leaders. So are perceived. It doesn't mean that you're not a leader or not. It's about how can you put yourself in the strategic position in the company 
to show that you have the, the opportunities to be the next generation leader in your company. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's uh, um, it's spot on. I think really when you're talking about like, you know, leadership specifically, you want to demonstrate that you can lead without getting that title, right? You want to be a manager. You don't need to get, get the manager title to lead. You can actually start managing, start influencing um, and getting work done, um, you know, as a leader and, and demonstrate that your capacity as a leader, uh, you know, with, with this, uh, you know, influence with those uh, um, indirect, uh, I guess, more of a, you know, dotted line control over the project, right? So I think it's not just about, hey, you know, can I, uh, can I get my manager title to, to do the manager work? You really want to demonstrate that you're, you have the capacity to do so even before you get promoted. Yeah. Um, and, and just want to add something yeah. to it that for lots of product manager interview questions, they will ask you, so for, for product manager will influence and negotiate every day. They will ask you a question, give me an example when you like, get alignment between multiple five stakeholders. How do you do that? This means influence. You got to give them a specific example how you change other people's opinion and get alignment. This is all influence um, that you need to get ready for all the interviews and, and that you actually need to execute in your real life as well so that you can be perceived as a leader. Yes. Um, and I have two more questions. I'm going to bundle that into one under the visibility and influence section, which is the third part of this question groups. And so if you're the hiring manager, sorry, if you're the like, you know, some kind of managers or maybe some, uh, you know, more of a senior member of the team, how do you ask for more headcounts uh, when there's hiring freeze um, organization, organization wide, right? This is very relevant to COVID-19 where everything is frozen up uh, in, in the budget for, for a lot of companies uh, in retails, in travel, et cetera. How do you do that? Um, you know, ask for more info because eventually the more people you have, you know, it's going to be a better case for you for next year's review, right? For you to get promoted to director, for VP, whatever. Um, so you, know, you, still, you want to start preparing for that step. And then, you know, also uh, conversely, like how do you also negotiate the scope of work and broaden the impact, right? So those are also question came from the, uh, the attendees. Um, I think that might, if you, you can shed some lights on that, that'd be great. So the, the question behind I want to ask you guys is uh, who do you negotiate with, right? This difference between negotiating with your stakeholders or your customers and also when you negotiate with uh, the internal teams. So what I imagine is that you're trying to negotiate with internal teams. Whenever we negotiate with a scope of like more people having more responsibilities, you can think about like two sides of the equations. On one side is that uh, is the environment. In COVID environment, it is harder in general. And which also means that certain department is easier, certain department is harder. For example, my department where I am is that we're a fast growing team. Everybody frees besides us. We are asked to hire 60 people next year. It's just like growing, like we are only 25 this year, ask 60 next year, it's growing. That was because in the, even if in the environment of COVID, if you put your micro environment, that your entire environment is fast growing and it's an important project for the company, it's way easier for you to ask for more. The sunset industry, there is sunrise industry. The sunset group and sunrise group. If you're in the sunrise group, it's easier because it just, the, the environment pushed you to grow, okay? So try to get into the sunrise group. So in, as an example, like for example, oil gas company, they are laying off people right now because nobody's driving. Um, yeah, so I call that sun, sun, sunset, I don't know, right? If you're in the oil gas industry, don't, don't blame me. Just example, as a sunset industry. Why on earth you push really hard, to ask for more money or more bigger scope in a sunset industry? I will focus on how can I jump ship to a sunrise industry, first of all. And the second, if you happen to be in the sunset industry, let's say you're in the, the travel industry that's you're also in the real gas, like oil gas industry that's also going down right now. If you really somehow, you don't want to change your environment, I'm sick here. I, even if sunset, I'm sticking here, what should you do, right? If it's sunset staying, uh, staying here, it's more towards, first of all, do you have executive sponsorship? Have you built your reputation? Everything I taught you, you need to do it ahead of time. Have you, when people talk about you, are you perceived as a leader? Right. If you have all the reputation ready, you also have your executive sponsorship. And then you also come up with a specific case saying that why I need more people. Why even if a sunset industry of oil gas, 
uh, or, or travel industry, I still need to double my team, come up with the legit answers. Because that part is easy, though, it's, it's all technical, right? But the other part is, do you have sponsors that say, yeah, it makes sense, we need to double it down, right? So you need to build allies in the company, especially the higher you go, the more politics are there and the more soft skills you need. There is not that much technical skills behind, the, as I said, based on the level you're in. The higher level you, like, Daniel yourself is VP, right? It's all part, not all part. Lots more people relationship, politics, different things involved. So that's how I see the environment and how would you build relationship to execute your proposal. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. I think from my perspective, um, to answer this question, it's actually very relevant to what I, what I, what's happening to me right now. So obviously, you know, with COVID-19, we have a, we have a hiring freeze. And but we we have a dire need to get this person on board. Um, you know, have this one open opening position that we are hoping to open, but uh, was shut down by you know um, uh, the CEO um, company wide because you know it, you know we want to make sure we get through the survival mode first first right. But now as you know, company is recovering. You know, I'm planning to put together a case um, to say, hey, here's the impact that I can make with this new hiring new headcount. Um, and once I um, you know, put together a case together, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll highlight, you know, this is the dollar amount that we can get out of it. And also here's a long-term impact, you know, some other project we can put together um, with, with the additional help. And so that's, you know, really put together, you know, bring the value into, the, into this discussion and highlighting that, you know, with the, what's, what's the benefits, uh, even though there's a systematic organization-wide um, hiring freeze, you can actually bring back, um, you know, one or two positions that are crucial to success of a really large project, right? So this is, uh, again, back to the value-based negotiation. Um, I wanna move to the, the salary negotiation, which is the last part of, my, uh, of the panel. So I think just very quickly, we talked about COVID a couple, couple times already. So what is the best uh, or the most sensible way to bring up the need for a raise? during the COVID-19, you know, where all the companies hiring like this budget freeze, you know, some, some places even have salary cut, right? So how would you bring up the need for a raise during the COVID-19? What is a sensible way to do that without, you know, while preserving the relationship and also with the understanding of the difficulty the company is facing? Yeah, so what I would do is, so first, understand how much other people is getting paid. If you are underpaid compared with your coworkers, regardless of COVID or not, you ask for more money. The biggest mistake I see 95% of all my students is that I want more. I was like, okay, what's on the, the other side of the table? You're already the top of your band. I know you want more, but you're top. So for all of you guys, I challenge all of you guys to understand, are you in the middle of the band? Are you top of your band? Or are you lower than everybody else? I bet 90% of you guys, you don't know where you are. And if you know, now the second part is, how can you bring this up? If you are just, you know you're lower than other people, I think it's, it's more straightforward, it's more towards how am I getting like, motivated working here, now, I, you understand that what's in their head regarding we want to go to survival mode and COVID is making big impact. I also want to feel motivated to join, uh, to continue to come to work. And given to my research, I know I'm underpaid or, and you also bring up the, the value or achievement you have done in the past. That's a better way to, to bring this to your employer at this moment to, uh, to my personal opinion. And of course, you also need to make it very clear to them you understand the current situation and, and what you also try to convince them to, to share with you what's on the other side of the table. Maybe the manager will tell you, well, this, this year, uh, we only, our margin decreased or everybody is reducing the amount of money for everyone that you understand. That's, that's a maximum you can do because everybody reduced the server 30%. Why on earth you, you have the right legit reason to ask? Right. I challenge all of you guys to figure out what's on the, the other side of the table before you even start asking. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but usually managers have a stack rank um, uh, procedure. So basically, hey, here's your, this is A player, B player, C player, and there's, this is people that we don't care if they leave, right? So, so usually there's a stack rank already happening. Again, that happens once a year, usually around the, um, the budget planning process, 
where you're forced, you know, as a manager, you're forced to, you know, to, to come up with a rank of your, of your, all your employee, including the best employee and the worst employee. And then, so if you can find out where you are on the stack rank, that's, that would be the best because you know, that's the information that's, dis that's not disclosed to you, right? We don't want people to feel like, oh, you're a C player or you're a B player, but also knowing that, you know, not everyone's going to be a player and there's a lot of value, lots of value for company to keep, make sure that retention rate for the B players are also solid, right? Cause you need a lot of B players to support a company. I need a few A players to make sure that you're leading the team. So not everyone can be a player. So, um, so the company understand that. So if you happen to be a B player, that's totally fine. Um, and you know, the company are still doing what they can to preserve you, to make sure that you stay. Um, I think the only challenge here is how do you find out that information? How do you know where you rank? You know, how do you know when you stack rank? I think that's really, if you, yeah, that's, there's no easy answer to that, right? You don't know their, your uh, peer salary. You do not know, um, it's also not appropriate to ask about that information um, for your managers. But sometimes you just have to sense it. You'd have to have a situation awareness, um, you know, from the, the group discussion, from project discussion, who does your boss listen to more, right? And also from your uh, uh, their name recognition, uh, you know, you, have, have, you can have a self-assessment are you having as big of impact as people that sit next to you, right? In the dollar amount. So those are all things that you can sort of, a, um, you know, do a little self-evaluation session um, on your own, but just, just knowing that, um, you know, there is a stack rank table that's, uh, that the manager put together once a year um, and uh, everyone's being, being ranked together. So. I made a that video. Race, sorry. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Talk, answer that question. Let me mute. So today. Hey, psst. sorry. I'm sharing this video with you guys. It talks about how would you find out the, the, the rank or whatever. I think towards the end of the video, let me share this with you guys so you can take a look. If it's not that video, let me know. I definitely made a video about this to answer these questions in a high level. Sorry, I, I, just, I have multiple screens going on. Uh, Daniel, go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, I want to, I, I know we're kind of sort of running out of time, but I want to go through one more, one more question on, on the panel. And I want to open up to all the questions that's on the screen, on the chat right now. So uh, I guess one more question is, can you accept, or sorry, once you negotiate a salary offer or once you accept the offer, do you have more room to negotiate more? So what, when is enough? So when is, um, you know, a good time to maybe stop negotiating or can you just continue to push? Well, for the seven principles uh, here, if you accept your offer, you accept everything. If you continue to push it, you're risking this, which is, hold on, I'm uh, dragging my screen, which is, which is more relationship, right? You already accept the offer. You try yourself, you try really hard to push. Then you somehow you, you don't have anything. Now you want to negotiate again. You're hurting the relationship. When you have a relationship, you think about the outcome. The outcome is either you walk away. They may say, you, let's say you are like a student of mine, she accepts the uh, Amazon offer for a really high number. Let's say she, I think we max out for sure. I, her number is the highest ever seen in Amazon. Let's say she walk in again next week saying, I want another 20 grand more. You are hurting the relationship. You already tried to max out your number. You, you said yes. And we already did multiple rounds of negotiation. Once you heard a relationship, the two things coming up, either you are ready to walk away if they say no, or once you join the company, how other people will perceive you for, for your relationship, especially after you accept the offer. Before you accept the offer, I think it's normal. Americans do this as well. You negotiate back and forth before you accept the offer. Once you accept, go ahead and, and think about what, how can you build a long-term relationship with the company. What do you think, Daniel? Um, I totally agree. I think the negotiation, you really want to make sure once you commit, you commit it, right? There's no um, drawing back because otherwise it make, renders your word uh, completely useless. Like you know, the trade deal with, with uh, the current administration, right? That's, you got you to gotta stick with what you have. So um, I, I think one possible suggestion I have though is you can't really negotiate after you have agreement, but you can add something to it. And, but offered it as in, hey, it's nice to have, but if you don't agree with it, that's totally fine. We still have the deal. So sometimes that's okay. So if you already a negotiated agreement uh, by you know, selling the car or accepted a job offer, it's okay to say, or sometimes uh, it's okay to say at the end, by the way, 
um, can you pay for, you know, this whatever amount? You make sure the number is not huge, right? It doesn't, doesn't trigger any kind of a, um, you know, negative reaction. But if you can add it to that, that would be great. If not, I'm totally fine. You know, let's stick with this negotiation, negotiate agreement and we already have a deal, right? So I think it's okay to ask for some extra bonus, but make sure that you let them know um, to accept or not accept does not impact this deal. So I think that might be okay, but again, use it, use it wisely. Um, don't, you know, your banner is, hey, if you don't agree to it, let's continue with this, you know, existing agreement. So that might, you know, again, a case by case, but you can think it through. That's also a two set you have. Um, it potentially can increase the, the value you get out of the negotiation a little bit further. Okay, all right. Um, and also, I think I have one more um, from the Saturday negotiation. So mm -hmm. if you are negotiating, typically what happens is you don't have multiple competing offers. So sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. So in the case of where you don't have any good banner uh, to fall back to, right? You don't have a good banner to go back, say, hey, I can go to the other company. Uh, how would you negotiate the salary um, with, your, uh, with, with the person that, uh, or with hiring manager, with HR, when there is no other competing offers? I answered this question already in Annie's, example you talk about your value to the company and she doesn't have a competing offer either she has a current job and she has her whatever new offer that's it right so when you negotiate in this situation you need to talk about your value you can bring to the company and how can you build a relationship with hr and honestly I've, i'm i'm pro in terms of get understanding and making the other side of the table telling me what's what's going on and usually all the recruiters and everything, they would tell me, Nancy, someone else is getting paid this much. So this is already the highest. So we're building a relationship, getting a deal together. So your relationship building and bring your value to the company. I answered this already and follow the same framework. You can, in this case, is here, starting from here. Yeah. Sounds good. So I'm going to close the panel and I want to open it to everyone. So there's some questions already in the chat. So let's just maybe just pick some uh, questions out. Um, Let's see, and, and, and at any point in time, or I guess right now, specifically, if you want to speak up, um, just unmute yourself. You can also ask questions too. So, you know, as long as we're not in the middle of that discussion. So- Yeah, I do need to leave soon. I have another, I'm teaching okay. soon. Yeah, okay, uh, okay. coming up and okay. but let's take one more questions. Anyone want to unmute yourself? Okay, and also you can select question from the chat too. So feel free to do that, Nancy. Um, well, whoever want to unmute themselves, I reward people who want to stand up. Uh, uh, okay. In addition, you can contact me uh, here. You can join the group and, and you can message me in private as well to ask your specific questions. Okay, since I don't know if there's technical Anyone want to unmute themselves? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if there's this kind of a system that's uh, preventing this from happening. So I need to probably do something here too, uh, making sure everyone's unmuted. <laughs> Okay, whoever wants to talk, feel free to speak up. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, so I think the best way is for me to ask a question then. Um, it's, it's, it, I think a lot of people are still Cooking. aware. Okay, so everyone else is muted except you. Okay. Hi there. Yeah, Hi yeah. there. My, my name is Dee. I want to check out one question. Is that when we negotiation with the management level, how they make the decision whether this person wants to be promoted or not? How the decision process looks like? Okay. Uh, Good question about getting promoted, the decision-making process of promoting something. I think that's a great topic for me to make a video because people ask this a lot, so let me tell you how things work behind the scenes. Is that at the end of every year, or in the middle, actually, not at the end, before decision was made, let's say October, September is, is in my video as well, that managers will have a discussion with HR, with each other. The way we, we decide who to get promoted is that, first of all, understand internally what are the opportunities or like op op promotion opportunities in terms of, do I have the headcount to bring up another manager or do I have the headcount to bring another like a directors? Do I have this or not? 
right? If, if not, then nobody get promoted with more tours. I can give you 3% increase, whatever the typical ones and normal, everyone goes this way, right? So if there is opportunity in my team that I can bring on another senior managers in my team or another director in my team, the way they make selections is that two part. And first of all, in big companies, they can, you can choose to select someone internally. You can also choose to bring somebody else from other teams. Well, under the same umbrella, could be the same company, but other teams, right? So managers will try to do this at the same time. I have seen managers, we, uh, when we get promoted, I was promoted internally straight up. We also promoted another manager. He came from the other team. If, when we talk about those opportunities, then the evaluation is towards can the current managers or the current individual contributors in my team being able to perform this new function as a manager or as a director? Are they qualified, right? So if not, I want to choose somebody outside and that can perform this function. And, and in addition, at the same time, for the people who are candidate for being this new manager or director positions, there are specific historical reputation you have built and achievement you had, and also whether this person uh, already had like sponsors or relationship with other part of the company. So promotion is just, yeah, she did very well running mathematical equations, so we should promote her. No, besides you do well, your, current, your, your historical performance will, will take a look as well. We'll also see you as a person because when you get into leadership or opportunities and positions, it's, it's more your people skills. People will start to take a look who has the people skills, who's, who's better at doing stakeholder management. Can he or she hold this position? Does this person has a future opportunity to continue to grow in the organization or not? So all these things will start to score you. And, and if none of you guys score high under the current manager, he or she will bring someone else from adjacent teams or he had great impression of another person. Usually the way I see this is that actually managers, 50% of them prefer to bring someone from outside because they, they want to bring a fresh mind, a fresh like, ideas. Another uh, like group of 50% manager want to promote someone inside. So it's all 50-50, it depends on who you are, which means when you jump, you can jump to the other team's manager as well. It's all relationship soft skill based. Okay, awesome. And Nancy, do you have one, uh, maybe two more minutes for answer for one last question? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think this is a, uh, someone asked about on the chat window, like how do you, so we talk about all the, you know, getting the raise successfully, but if you fail, um, to get a salary raise for your current job. Um, and this happens a lot. Uh, how do we deal with the aftermath? No, I think there's no failure in asking a raise if you didn't get it. I don't see this as a failure. First of all, I'll give a credit to you because you ask. Lots of people do not ask even if they're underpaid. And second, even if you couldn't get it here, uh, this year, nobody will hate you for, oh, she asked for more money this year. I just start to hate her. I wouldn't bring her to my new job, new project anymore. No, nobody hates you for you to ask for more money if you know how to ask. If you know using the principal teacher today, you will never, nobody will hate you. You'll never have back, a backlash. The, the only thing is that how can you win or get more next year. So I would, I, I would encourage people to ask, use the right methodology. So I, I bet 95% of you today on the chat, you don't know your rank. No wonder people feel, oh, you asked before, I can't give you your, your C level, your rank C, no wonder I can give you. You don't even know your C or B or A. I, I challenge all of you guys, find out that first, then you have reasonable, legit reason to ask, you know where you stand, you know whether it's you're already a top A, of course you cannot get. It's not a failure, you're top already, right? So because you guys don't know what's on the other table. Okay, thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, I know you ran out of time, so we're gonna wrap it up right here. And you have all Dr. Nancy's uh, uh, contact information um, and the YouTube channel. You can also just kind of, uh, if you have questions, um, I think that some of them can probably answer some of, the, some of your questions already. So uh, let's stop here. And uh, Nancy, you also, I think you also have an email address somewhere, right? So make sure that they can see it and they can reach out to you. I think there's a lot of questions that's left to be, an to be answered. But unfortunately, we ran out of time. Um, so we'll have you, you know, maybe just reach out to Nancy in, um, you know, after session 
and then I'm sure she, you know, she has time. Um, she can work with you, and she also offered those two additional services uh, for boot camp and also uh, uh, negotiation services uh, for you. Uh, you know, at, you know, at the you know the right you know compensation. So so just reach out to her, um, and everyone appreciate joining our session. Appreciate uh, Dr. Nancy Lee for joining us and giving us such a wonderful talk. Uh, we have more session coming up in the coming month, uh, more specific on the influence. Um, and also uh, there's more discussion about some other soft skill uh, that we'd like to touch on. So uh, again, appreciate everyone's time and then please give us feedback. Thank you so much. And yes. then yeah, the email address is Dr. Nancy Lee, edu, edu at gmail.com. Gmail so uh, please write it down, take a picture of it and feel free to reach out to her after the session. All right, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Appreciate everyone's time. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right, thank you. All right, bye. Bye.